Thank you. Thanks for having me, Asushi. I um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody, and especially when it's about our friends, the cats. I um, was the past executive director for the Wind Feline Foundation, and have taken a special, they have taken a special place in my heart um, because of the, everything that I've been working on with them in the past. So um, welcome everybody. Uh, wanted to provide you with an opportunity to think more and focus more on the cats. Um, we typically um, do a hard concentration on the dogs, which they do deserve to, but um, I think sometimes we forget about our kitties. So. Um, the um, um, we want to keep all pets happy and, and safe. That's what we do, right? Um, we got into these careers as veterinarians, veterinary technicians, veterinary assistants, veterinary team members to take care of them and advocate for them. Um, they they need our help in um, communicating to their pet parents. Um, communicating to us and we need to be aware of that. So we want to also teach our pet parents how to be the best they can be and what they can do to keep their furry family members happy and healthy. Um, it's important to build that relationship with them and their trust so they think of us as the people to go to. Um, I know that's all of our um, priority uh, but sometimes we forget about that it doesn't come naturally for the pet parent to think of us that way. They're concerned when th something goes wrong with their pet and they want um, they want answers. So just like us, um, if our kid was sick or if we were sick, they go to Google or the, the internet to find those answers. And we want to bring that back to them thinking about the veterinary professionals in that capacity. Um, we need to keep them as in, include them as part of the healthcare team. Um, what they see at home is so can be so different than what we see in the practices, and especially these days with everything COVID, um, times have changed. So we want to keep them in the center of the veterinary healthcare team as well. So I talked about the dogs. Um, they've gotten a lot of attention over the years, um, and that's great because they're deserving of that too. But we have to bring the cats back into the picture, um, do a little bit of concentrating on them. And I think that's um, what has been happening in the profession these days. Um, cats are coming about. Um, millennials have more cats at home because they're um, termed easier to take care of um, or not as um, needy as the dogs tend to be. But we have to take a look at that too because we know um, that cats do require care and they do tend to mask some of the things that are going on and we need to have the the client uh, pet parent thinking about those things too as we go along so we want to help them um, bring the cats into full circle remember that they do have those at home too um, besides the dogs and that they need to be seen and cared for just as much as the dogs How are we doing with these, these critters so far? I think we're doing a, a great job if they're being seen. Um, and I think that um, there's a lot more that we can be doing. There's so many more tools that have come about in the last few years, specifically to cats. And um, like I said before, cats are coming full circle and they're getting the, the attention that they deserve, but we need to make that happen and help implement that um, focus. So new behavior trends, um, new medicine, which is great. When Feline Foundation does a lot of research, um, I think they're the only um, organization in the whole world that totally concentrates their dollars to um, cat health research. And that um, brings a new perspective to veterinarians, to cat owners, to cat um, enthusiasts which um, is very much needed. So new research and discoveries help us improve what we do for our kitties. Um, specialties, um, 
and you know the practices different organizations have come up with recommendations and new guidelines for cats in particular so they are helping us um, in making a point of helping us with what we do in the practice day to day and help make those kitties um, more healthy in every way So that being said, there is a lot of stuff going on. Um, where do we start with all of it? it um, and I wanna say, when I look in this cat's mouth, uh, it might be a sturdy place, but um, um, besides that, there's so many different areas that we can concentrate on um, that need to happen, but we, we've gotta dial it back a little bit and take it little bits by little bits. Um, we don't wanna be, overwhelmed by the thought of, oh my gosh, I need to do this, I need to do that. Um, there's just take a step back and um, a sense of reality. We can't do it all. Um, we know that we're busier than ever these days because of COVID and everybody um, getting those shelters cleared out. Um, it's a great thing, but it puts another burden on us. Um, so we, we need to start, start thinking about, you know, priorities, what makes sense for our practices. Um, we, we tend to think that we need to do it all. Uh, we want to do it all, but in reality, we can't. And so if we can take and assign two team members, um, allowing the veterinary team members input and actual participation in getting some of these lined out, it will be um, a more pleasant experience. And I think that our clients will realize that we're doing a better job at it too. Um, we wanna make sure that all of the different team members are being heard because each of us bring a different perspective and have wonderful ideas. You know, it's um, doctors and practice managers play an important part, but so do the other team members. And I think working as a team takes a lot of pressure off of everybody and everybody feels better about it being included as part of, as part of the team. You also um, think about how many different people bring a certain passion to that team. So, you know, one of the technicians may love dentistry or another might like parasitology or, you know, somebody likes the behavior portion of it. Take advantage of that because each of us bring to the table something special and it makes our practice better. So if we take it piece by piece, um, I think we all know starting with examinations is probably um, where everybody starts. Um, they're important in every stage of the cat's lives um, from little, little guys to um, aging seniors. And we know that things um, can get missed if the cats don't come in and we see them as a, you know, a very hardship sometimes when they come in so sick that we can't help them. So determining how often they should be coming in and relaying that to your clients is a big one. Um, examinations can uncover, you know, dental disease, um, constipation, ear mites, ear infections, um, eyes, you know, everything. Um, so it is important. Um, we all know that cats can have um, cardiac issues too. So getting them in to be seen on a regular basis is very important. Um, and we do know too that, you know, down the road, it may make sense to bring them in more than once a year. Um, the younger that you start, um, educating the client on this and why it's important, the better results you're going to have. Vaccines is a big one. Um, and I, we all know that it's harder um, most of the time to have our kitties being um, cared for and brought in at the appropriate times, um, if at all. And you wanna make sure that you have a vaccine program down um, and that everybody on your team is aware of what you're um, recommending so that everybody's on the same page. 
um, it's not um, atypical to have a client come in and hear it, but not really hear it. So you need be, to be focusing that message anywhere from seven to 10 times before they actually put things into perspective and start listening. And you can do that in many different ways. Um, you, utilizing your different communication channels um, every time that you see them or you get an opportunity to talk to them when they're in the practice helps as well. Um, your, um, what you're recommending could be different from somebody you say um, 200 miles away. Um, every practice is different. Every location can be different. Um, there are vaccine guidelines from AHA and AAFP, um, WASAVA, and many other organizations that have put those in place for you to look at and determine what the best um, practice is for you. Um, but remember that it's important for all the team members, even the CSRs, to have that familiarity um, with your recommendations so that the clients are hearing it. Same story every time. You want to make sure that you have outlined in the core vaccines as well as what you're recommending for the non-core options um, because of the different areas of the, um, the world and the different um, environmental factors and lifestyles that these kids um, come into contact with and are exposed to. So make sure that you sit down and have that discussion and come up with a plan specific to your practice. Parasites are a big one. I think it's a lot of times where we kind of forget too how important it is. Um, Kitties come into contact with little critters all the time, even if they're totally indoor house cats. I know um, we don't like to think of that, those mice coming in. Um, me as a Minnesota person know that those critters do come in um, unexpectedly and expose our um, kitties to the, the parasites that they bring in. And it's just the nature of the beast. They, um, they love to play with them. Um, I know that one of mine will just uh, chase it and bat it around, and then the other one will go full blown out attack mode. Um, so it's important to remember that no matter what their environment is, that they're going to be exposed at some point. Um, bringing the dogs in and out um, can also be a, a danger. We, we know that. It's important to relay this information to your clients, um, the pet parents, because they don't understand that. They don't have the education that we do, and it's our jobs to relay that to them. We need to make the recommendations because that's what they're going to start listening to. Um, even though we have to say it over and over and over again, um, it's, it's a must. It's our part of our job. Um, it can be um, very boring sometimes to relay that same myth message over and over again throughout the day but it's an important one. We have to remember that those parasites can be not only transmitted to other furry family members, but to the rest of the family as well. So it's a zoonotic. Um, you wanna keep everybody safe. And um, we don't always think about kitties getting um, heartworm disease, but it is, it's there and we, sometimes um, try to avoid that topic just because it's so been so um, unpredictable and it's not always that straightforward to understand feline heartworm disease, but it is there. And um, I was just listening to Byron Blackburn um, a few weeks ago stating that there's more and more cases of it and it we should be testing. Um, we should be putting these cats on preventative also to protect them from the, the intestinal parasites because most of the preventatives out there these days do have the capability of protecting our kitties from other things. So um, it's important to relay that message to your, your um, pet parents. They also have um, studies out there now that um, it's 
even more important in the more presidented areas for um, canine heartworm because those same mosquitoes are there for um, the kitties too. And we all know that mosquitoes come through the screens. So keeping them on a year round preventative for heartworm and intestinal parasites um, can be a huge benefit for keeping that, that little um, furry friend of ours um, protected and happy and healthy. Nutrition, um, clients want our recommendations. I know it, it's, you can't fit everything into the exam um, one time. You know, it, there's so much information out there that we need to convey to our pet parents. So we need to be doing it different ways too. Um, saying it seven to 10 times before they really truly understand things is, it's hard. It's very hard because there's so much information and you know they're on overload when they leave the place. So take advantage of the, the veterinary professionals on your team. Technicians can certainly do follow-up calls. They can do tech appointments and counseling on nutrition and parasites um, in a more detailed way that the, in an, maybe in even a Zoom call would be beneficial so that you can have their full attention um, you can interact with them and the pet and bring some tele, telemedicine, teletriage things into your practice. Um, nutrition changes. Um, there's not just one, one fix for all stages of life. So we need to make sure that our pet parents understand that too. We need them coming to us us making the recommendations to them instead of them going to Dr. Google or the 16 year old kid that's in the pet store um, focusing on the flavor of the month that they've been trained on. Um, this does happen and this is reality that the uh, pet parents are exposed to a lot of information from a lot of different people these days. And so we need to ensure that our patients are getting the the right things and that the pet parents are brought full circle into the conversations and have an understanding of why we're doing things. Um, definitely different than way back when I graduated because there weren't many diets and um, not as much information out there. Um, it's funny how 35 years of, <laughs> of being in the profession changes over the time, but um, I, I think that there's so much more going on here that um, nutrition does make a difference in every stage of, of um, life and in, of, of course, with different diseases. So um, really make a, a con really try to concentrate on making those recommendations. I know, um, like I said, it's, it's a lot and we, we get bombarded with a lot, but take baby steps, um, implement things. The more contact that you have with your pet parents and clients, they, they're gonna get, be able to trust you more and keep you in the mindset that that's who they need to contact when things come up with their pets. They're gonna start coming to you instead of you going to them. Playtime we sometimes forget about too. Um, it's important to educate the, the pet parent uh, on what's good, what's safe. Um, knowing that these kitties are gonna, if they don't provide safe toys for them and point them in the right direction, that they're gonna find their own things in the household um, that we probably don't want them to get a hold of. Or um, it could be detrimental to you know, the pet parent saying, oh, I can't handle the behavior. Um, they're wrecking my couch. I need to do this. I need to do that. Um, can't keep the cat anymore. It's a huge problem. So we need to start um, placing that in the back of our minds too, that making those recommendations for safe toys, for climbing trees, for you know, scratching posts, Everything that's going to help that pet parent more relaxed and more comfortable, um, more able to take care of their pets instead of seeing some of the behavior issues or the, the things that they don't like to see um, happen. And 
providing those um, different opportunities for these kitties is, is great. Um, I think too that with the time coming that AAFP has made a stance as well as many practices are not decline anymore. So it is a, you know, there's a need to make that pet parent understand, you know, the importance of providing the options out there for these pets. And so they're not coming back to the shelters. Um, new times, certainly, um, there won't be the option of decline um, before we know it. Um, so think about that. Oops. The litter box and then litter box behavior, you know, I picked this one because there's a lot of things that we take for granted that we know um, that pet parents don't. Uh, they, you, you don't want to buy this big, huge litter box for a tiny kitten uh, because it's going to make it harder for them to get in and out. It's, it's a scary thing. So start talking about um, everything that they need um, pertain before they make the purchase or during that first exam or in your um, kitten handouts that you provide them, you know, picking this, the litter box according to size, um, whether it's automatic, because that can be scary to the cats too. Um, many different kinds of litters out there these days um, and materials. So scented, non-scented, um, paper, uh, you know, there's so many different options. It's overwhelming to that pet parent uh, in the decisions. So point them in the right direction for the kitty and not something that maybe smells good to them or intrigues them because of what they like. Um, be proactive in making the recommendation that's going to appeal to that kitty versus the pet owner. Teeth and mouth. Um, we all know that kitties have those small little teeth that um, can become big blocks and chunks of um, tartar. And it's important to, you know, educate the owner to take a peek in there, understand what's going on because before it happens so quickly, um, things can get really bad before the pet parent even understands. And that cat is suffering a lot. Um, educate as far as brushing your teeth. I know we, we don't even do that all the time when we're veterinary professionals but we need to um, provide the best education to those pet parents um, to give them the opportunity to do the things. We might, maybe we don't think they're gonna do it. Well, they may surprise us and that's important for the kitty. Um, regular checkups and exams will help with um, keeping the teeth intact too. Um, there are other mouth problems, of course, you know that um, pop up and can be very painful to these kitties. So making sure that the, the client understands to, it's okay to get your cat used to looking in the mouth and taking a look on a regular basis. So if anything does look you know, funny to them, that's even more indication of bringing them in. Um, use your FaceTime. Um, a lot of times we don't think about those things anymore. But if something's going on and the, you know, the client hesitates to bring the kitty in, um, because we all know how well they love jumping in those carriers and coming to see us, um, it may make us and the pet parent more comfortable in seeing what's going on before we make a recommendation of, yes, you absolutely have to come in. So many diseases, um, cancer, diabetes, thyroid issues. You know, we need to take um, advantage of the time with the client and, you know, even the communication with the client in different ways, educating them what can happen in different cats. Um, and that it's not necessarily a death sentence. I, I cringe every time I hear that people don't want or it's too much trouble to take care of a diabetic cat or something along those lines. It might not be for everybody. 
but they also have to understand that it can be done and it's doable. This is these areas can be tech technician appointments, you know, for um, more exposure to the client and more comfort level. They don't always have to come in. You can have that conversation with them on the phone via Zoom, um, email, text, uh, just that um, so they know that you're there for them and guiding them in that direction um, of keeping, keeping the diabetes under control, other diseases under control. Um, there's telemedicine, telemedicine is great for these situations. Um, there's also, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to do at home blood sugar checks, um, blood glucose checks um, with a team. You, we've got to be creative in accommodating the cats and the pet parents because we're busy, they're busy too, and we're, we've got to uh, work together to. Um, come up with ideas and um, solving problems and keeping those pets healthy. Um, there's so many more opportunities too for um, guidelines in these areas. So don't hesitate to do a little research um, once again with AHA and WASAVA and AAFP. You know, there's guidelines out there to help us. And it's important for these pets. Um, because of the pet parents needing to understand what we're asking of them too. Lab work um, is going to vary. You know, what's your recommendation as a kitten? Um, does we, we do feline leukemia tests, testing all the time? Um, do we need the vaccines? You know, it's going to depend on your area. Um, lab work according to age, do you run lab work every year, um, every six months, you know, it, it's different in every situation. So you need to sit down as a team, determine what's best um, at each stage of life, um, at least initially, things are gonna change, but make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, I talked about maybe implementing some, um, blood glucose checks at home. Um, those are quick checks that you can send a tech or and an assistant out um, just to make it more convenient for the, the pet parent um, and more peace of mind too. Um, but make sure that you're making those recommendations. Don't hesitate because it's might be hard to get a sample or convince a client. They need to be brought in as part of the team and understand what you're making as recommendations and why it's important. Aging, um, aging cats or seniors, we all know that they need a little extra TLC. Um, they, it's hard on them, it really is. And we need to, have a, the parent understand what stages and everything their cat is going through and what potential diseases pop, might pop up, what they should be looking for, what special testing they need. Um, they, they go through a lot and even um, arthritis, pain management. Uh, there's so many different things that we can be doing for these cats, so many treatments, preventatives, um, Holy cow, my, I have climbing boards all over the place for my, my senior cats that my husband thinks is ridiculous, but it's, they can't jump up anymore or they, they hesitate to jump. And that's an indicator. So we need to have our pet parents eyes on that too, because they're the ones that have to determine um, at what point there might be some um, pain and relay that to us so that we can we can handle that we can control some of it going on make recommendations for medication or other items that can help with some of this stuff classes um, we all think about dog classes but do we think about kitten classes and it's times of change um, the 
Zoom option is certainly an option because they're more comfortable at home and you can actually have the, the pet parents um, more interactive in these situations because they're not worried about their cat in front of them together um, with other cats. So it's a, an opportunity to relay some of these messages, some of these learning opportunities that um, only take, you can take 15 minutes to a half an hour to an hour, whatever you think is best for your, your um, practice, um, what you want to relay in these classes. Um, it doesn't have to be um, anything that is real controlled type of thing. You can, you can make it fun. You can dress them, you know, have the pet parents dress the cats up, make it, make a party once in a while, um, make a class that they are asking questions. You know, what, what do they want to talk about? Because we want to know what they, you know, what, what interests them, what their, um, what lies in the back of their minds about their pets. Um, this provides opportunity to also interact with other pet parents and they may be having the same issues or have had the same issues and can offer um, some suggestions of what they've done in the past. Um, so it's a good opportunity to bring the clients together, engage again and, um, bring back once again that we are the, the trusted individuals and the experts on um, their pet's health. Obesity, we know, um, kind of goes with nutrition, but we also know that it is a real, um, real issue within the U.S. and the cats these days. And this can provide an opportunity for tech appointments, um, concentrating on a real weight loss program, um, understanding the struggles that each of the pet parents go through, um, keeping a, an eye on the individual cat and you know, making a, doing a celebration at each different point that they reach. Um, they need to know that it, it's hard, <laughs> you know, you wanna accommodate that kitty crying and wanting the food, but it also has consequences. So having them understand um, disease can um, arise from obese, obesity and um, that there are ways in, in dealing with it. Um, it's hard, definitely hard, but it's a celebration once you're successful too. We talked about pain management a little bit with the aging guys, but um, you know, pain can happen at any point, um, not just with the old timers. Um, it can be in younger animals, um, adults and seniors. Um, we need to be able to recognize when they're, they're dealing with this. So there's a lot of different, um, and there's new tools that you can use actually, and it's good to have the pet parents aware of these tools. Um, the Grimace scale, if you don't know about that, it um, actually pertains to the faces of the cats, you know, what they're looking like when each different um, stage of pain. And that can be very helpful um, for the pet parent to understand that you know, there's different body language, different um, facial expressions that call out some of these things that we can deal with um, and that it's important to call um, or, you know, get a hold of the veterinary professionals to just determine what's best in that treatment plan. So it, it is very hard um, getting them in or understanding where those cats are. Um, even if we know that they're there, they don't like to go in those carriers. Um, it is been brought, it has been revealed in studies that there are many, many cats in the households that the dogs are coming in, but they're not coming in. So it's important to ask, 
when you have any of the clients in the hospitals, say, hey, do you have a cat at home? Because they need care too. You know, get the conversation going of what's going on at home, um, who's there. Um, this can generate a lot of, a um, lot, lot more clients coming in or a lot more pets coming in. And you can even work with animal shelters too that are local, you know, your local animal shelter um, coming up with programs to, you know, build awareness of why cat, it's important for cats to come in, you know, maybe have a, a discount program if um, you don't already having um, exams or come in for um, an, a free nail clip, you know, demonstrating these things and working together in the community also builds awareness of, you know, why it's important for us to be that, those experts. We talked a lot about resources. Um, AAFP is one of them that has the guidelines for many, many different things um, relating to pet or cat health um, <clears throat> and disease. They have a lot of educational tools. They have um, cat friendly practice recommendations and um, a lot of great information and downloadable um, information for you and your clients. Um, AHA has the different guidelines. Um, nutrition is one of them. For dogs and cats, they typically run things together, um, but also a great resource for downloading things, um, taking advantage or trying to implement your programs in your, in your practices. And um, mention the feline uh, grimace scale. Um, these are photos that are in there, but there's a lot of resources that you can download and you know keep in, in the exam rooms, um, not so much with COVID anymore, it's, but you can um, actually include these in some of your handouts and things that you maybe send home or include in newsletters, um, communications, um, social media. The other two are Companion Animal Parasite Council, which they have a great, um, prevalence map that can hone in on your specific county, state and county that you're in, and give you the different um, canine, canine and feline breakdowns of heartworm or um, hookworms, any of the parasites, um, internal and external, and give you a number. Um, you can sign up for updates. Um, on a monthly basis, they will give you an update of what's going on in your county um, so that you can post those in your exam room or even put them in newsletters and communication to your clients. Um, American Heartworm Society also has some of the guidelines and everything um, for you to utilize. Um, these are all great resources for you to put in place um, within your practice what you feel comfortable with. Um, good point of contact. And um, there's certainly, all of these are open for um, questions if you have any. Um, so make sure that you know that there's places to go to and for this information and um, they are there for you for a reason and um, want to help you. So all of this, there's a lot that we do and have yet to do to um, make our little feline friends um, happy and healthy, keep them safe. Um, but it's important to remember too that um, part of this is really interacting with the client and bringing them on as part of the team. Um, they know what goes on at home. They're the ones that are gonna notice something that's going on. And we want to make um, their experience very positive as well as the, the kitties and make them happy and healthy um, and as comfortable as possible. And we're hoping, you know, with all the efforts that we make, um, that will make a difference. And I think that any little bit that you implement is gonna have make a huge difference. You know, anything that we do to help our four-legged um, friends is 
is huge. Um, and it's hard to make change. It's hard to implement different things, especially when we're so busy. But keep in the back of your mind that you don't have to do it all at the same time. You can just take baby steps. Anything that you do is going to help those um, furry friends of ours. So lose my voice a little bit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you for listening and attending today. And welcome any questions that you might have.